Hey everybody, welcome back to Complex Analysis. So today we are getting into the calculus portion of Complex Analysis. Today is really, really exciting. Now, how we're gonna proceed from here is very similar to what we would do back in the calculus course. We would start with functions, get a little bit more comfortable with them, which we're gonna do really, really fast because I'm assuming everyone's seen functions and has been exposed to functions for, for at least a while now. Um, and then we're going to get into limits. And remember, limits sort of form the basis of all of calculus. They're, you know, they're involved with continuity. They're in the definition of derivatives, definition of integrals. Um, so we'll, we'll start by defining limits. Um, and in this video, we'll get into continuity. The next video, we're actually going to look at the precise definition of a limit more carefully. Um, but in any case, it's going to proceed very, very similar to how we, we approached calculus. Okay, so just be prepared, except in our setting, now we're just dealing with complex numbers. So let's begin on a quick core, or a quick refresher on functions. So um, we define complex, num or complex functions similar to how we would define real functions. So a complex function, f, is a map from a subset g to c. Okay, so a subset g of c, I should say, to c. So here's a picture. Okay, so what we're saying here is our domain, or our inputs, are coming from some blob g, okay, which is in c. And then the function is taking points in here, and it's mapping them into c again. Okay. So that's the picture I want you guys to have in the back of your heads. So this is what our, the functions we're going to be dealing with are doing. Okay. Now, just like we had back in calculus, we call the set of inputs the domain, okay? And one note, at least about domain, in complex analysis, we still cannot divide by zero. That's still a no-no. Okay, I usually call that Thanos snapping. Um, we still cannot divide by zero. Now that we have i, though, we can sort of relax our, our square root rules, but we still have to be a little bit careful, though, which we'll get into later. Um, but in any case, we call our inputs the domain, and then the outputs, we call that the image. Okay, so z is our input, f of z our output. Okay, but at least very, 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 very similar to what we had back in, in, in calculus with real functions. Okay, so at this point, there's nothing that makes complex functions too different from functions that we had back in calculus. Um, we can still construct very, very similar functions that we had um, had back in the day, or by back in the day, I mean probably like last year for you all. In any case, we can define what we would call the identity function, so f of z equal to z. We can define quote unquote linear type functions. Okay, now notice I'm using quotes on all of these because we can't visualize it anymore. So I'm not saying f of z equal to minus 5z plus 2 is actually a straight line or anything like that. Remember, since we're going from c to c, we need four dimensions to visualize these things. Um, f of z equal to z cubed. It's kind of like a cubic function. f of z equal to z squared, a quadratic function. And then f of z equal to 1 over z, we would call this back in calculus a rational function. Okay, So in any case, we can still define similar type functions that we had back in calculus. But remember, complex numbers come with their own different types of representations, right? We can think about complex numbers like z, or in rectangular coordinates, x plus i, y. Or remember, we can think about them as polar coordinates. Okay. So using these different representations, we have actually a lot more flexibility with complex functions. We could define something like this, f of x, y. So this is, remember, z is equal to x plus i, y. Okay. So if z is equal to x plus i, y, we can define a complex function, f, x, y, equal to 2x plus 3y minus i, x. Said differently, or said in other words, this is 2 times the real part plus 3 times the imaginary part, minus i times the real part. Okay, Or if we think about our complex numbers and polar coordinates, we can define a function f r phi equal to 2 times the radius mi minus e to the argument of um, whatever your complex number is. 
Okay. So in any case, we can utilize the different representations of complex numbers and actually come up with more flexible or uh, more varieties of functions, which is actually really awesome because that enables us to solve problems. It gives us more, I would say, tools in our tool bag to solve different problems. Okay, so let's get into the calculus portion now. So like we did in calculus, remember, all of calculus starts with the limit, right? Everything is built out of that limit. So um, we're going to start our, our calculus experience with the definition of a limit. Now, the way we define the limit is very, very similar to what we had back in calculus. Um, and we're going to define what we call the precise limit of the definition, or the precise definition of the limit, I should say. So recall, back in calculus, we would say, and we're just going to talk really quick about the intuitive definition of the limit. We say that the limit as x approaches x0 of f of x equals l so when we say a function has a limit, what we really mean is that, let's say this is x0, and let's say this is l, okay? So we would say f of x has a limit of l as x approaches x0 if, when we get really, really close to x0, okay, on both sides, our function is getting really, really close to l. Okay, so when our inputs get really, really close to x0, our outputs get really, really close to L. Okay, Now the problem with that is, well, it's a good interpretation, and hopefully you guys remember that from, from calculus, right? That's what a, what a function having a limit actually means. Um, it's not precise enough. Okay, so how do you, so what, what I would interpret as close might be different to how you would interpret close, right? Just think about our personal bubbles, right? Some people have very, very little personal bubbles where some of us, you know, are personal bubbles are like, you know, the size of a, an, an entire house or something. Um, so in any case, how do we actually get this closeness um, in a definition? How do we make this precise? So um, Newton and Leibniz kind of sort of independently, I would say, came up with the limit of the definition as follows. So here's the precise definition. How do we get that idea of closeness mathematically. So we say that a limit as x approaches x0 of f of x equals l, if and only if, so here's the precise bit, for every epsilon greater than 0, okay, there exists a delta greater than 0 such that, okay, so we have an epsilon greater than 0. Think about epsilon as a very, very small positive number. Think about delta as a very, very small positive number. So for every epsilon greater than, zel uh, greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero such that if x minus x naught is less than delta, so what this is saying here, remember the absolute value is a distance, right? So it's saying if x minus x naught, so if x is really close to x naught, close to x naught, then, okay, remember our, our intuitive idea of a limit, what should happen if x is really close to x0, then f of x should be really close to L. Okay, so this is how right here, this is how we define the limit of a function precisely. Okay, it gets at that idea of closeness, but now we've introduced some epsilons and deltas here. Now the way we, uh, by the way, so we are gonna, we're gonna deal with this in the next video and actually see how to use this definition. So we're gonna sort of proceed kind of like what we would do in a, a normal calculus class. Um, but in any case, we will get comfortable with this definition. I want you guys to get comfortable with this because in 420, this is gonna be really, really important that you understand this. Um, in any case, how do we define complex limits? Very, very similar. So let f be a complex function. Let z0 be an accumulation point. We'll talk about that in a second. If w0 is some complex number, such that for every epsilon greater than 0, we can find a delta greater than 0, so that for all z and g satisfying our inequality here, then f of z minus w0 is less than epsilon in this case. Okay. So again, I just want you guys to see this is very similar. I'm going to use a different color for this. This definition of the limit here is very similar to what we had back in calculus, except instead of x's, we have z's. 
Instead of x naught, we have z naught. Instead of l, we have w naught. But everything else is exactly the same, okay? Uh, except for this accumulation point, which we'll talk about in a second. But in any case, we say that the limit as z approaches z naught of f of z equals w naught, if and only if, for every epsilon greater than 0, there exists a delta greater than 0 such that if z minus z naught is less than delta, then f of z minus uh, w naught is less than epsilon. OK, so a couple of notes on the definition. First of all, we required z naught to be an accumulation point. Now, um, in calculus, we don't really make that, that a, a sticking point. But the reason why we do it in, in complex analysis is because we want to be able to get as close as possible to z naught. Remember, the idea behind a limit is you can let your inputs get very, very close to some number, right? It's the same idea in complex analysis. We want to get to as close as z naught as possible. So we want it to be an accumulation point so that if we take any delta ball or uh, unit disk of radius delta around z naught, we always have a z inside there. Remember, that's what an accumulation point is. It's a, it's a point in your domain such that any unit disk centered at that point contains a point z that's not itself. Okay, so this allows us to get as close to z naught as possible. Um, another thing that's very similar to our definition and the calculus definition is that the limit definition doesn't actually require z naught, the point we're taking the, the limit to. Um, it doesn't actually require that z naught to be in the domain of f. Okay, so recall back in calculus, it's the same idea. Let's say we were computing the limit as, I gotta think off the top of my head. Uh, the limit as x approaches 1 of x squared minus 1 over x minus 1. Okay, So notice that with this function here, this rational function, 1 is not in the domain of this because we blow up. right? We can't divide by 0. However, and I'll leave you guys to do this, you do actually find a limit. This limit does exist, and it's actually equal to 2. Okay, um, So just like in... in Calculus, in complex analysis, we don't actually need to have z naught be in the domain of the function in order to take the limit. In fact, sometimes we're going to be doing this because sometimes we get more interesting results if this z naught here is not in the domain. Um, and then, like I said earlier, you will want to get comfortable with the limit definition. We'll discuss that a little bit more um, in the next class and video, though. OK. So at least we're going to go ahead and sort of proceed in sort of a Calc 3 perspective. So limits, at least computing limits, is very, very similar to, um, to Calc 3. So if we're taking the limit as z approaches z naught of f of z. So first of all, if z naught is in the domain of, of f, usually we can just plug this into the function and call it a day. This is kind of getting at continuity a little bit, but... Um, in any case, we call this the direct substitution property. Okay, so usually, again, if your z naught, your accumulation point there, is in the domain of f, usually we can plug it in, call it a day. Okay. However, if we want to show a limit doesn't exist, we can sort of take that calc 3 approach. Remember in calc 3, if we were dealing with, and I'm going to change colors here, if we were looking at the limit as xy approaches ab of f of xy, and we wanted to show that this limit did not exist, one way we could have done that is by using different paths. So remember, when we have a different, when we have a bigger dimension, we have a little bit more flexibility with limits. So let's say this is ab. So when you're in 2D, like we are in complex land, you can approach this point in infinitely many ways. And if you can show that the limiting value along two different paths are different, then you know the limit does not exist. It's the same thing in complex land. If you're trying to show a limit doesn't exist using paths, all you have to do is come up with two paths okay, that give you a different limiting value. And if you can find that, then you would show that this limit here would not exist. Okay. 
So we can still use the same sort of procedure techniques that we had back in Calc 3. Okay, so let's look at some examples. So if we're taking the limit as z approaches 3 of 2z minus 5, so here notice 3 is in the domain of this um, of this function here, 2z, 2z minus 5, so we can use the direct substitution property. And we get that this is in this case, let's see, 6 minus 5 equal to 1. Okay. Now if we look at our second limit here, now we kind of have, we run into an issue. Okay, so now we're taking the limit as z approaches 0 of the conjugate. Remember that bar over the top of a complex number that's conjugate. So we have that the, uh, the limit as z approaches 0 of the conjugate of z over z. Okay, and we're taking the limit as z approaches 0. Now again, the problem with this is PowerPoint. There we go. Uh, the problem with this limit is we can't just plug in 0, right? Because we, we would be dividing by 0. Okay. So let's look at some paths. OK, so we're going to sort of do what we normally do in uh, a Calc 3 class. So here is 0 at the origin. I'm going to use a different color here. OK, and we're going to approach the origin two different ways. So we're going to approach the origin along the imaginary axis. And uh, along the imaginary axis, this is, remember, x equals 0. If we think about z in its rectangular coordinates, and we're going to approach it along the real axis, or in this case, y is equal to 0. Okay, So we have two different paths. So really quick, before I do that, I'm just going to write this out. Limit as z approaches 0 of x minus i y over x plus i y. Okay, so I'm just writing out z in terms of its um, rectangular coordinates here. And now we're going to do look at two different paths. So path one, we're going to look at um, going along the imaginary axis here. Okay, so the limit as z approaches 0 along x equal to 0, we're going to get x minus, oops, should say 0 minus zero minus i y over 0 plus i y, which is going to give us the limit z approaches 0 along x equals 0 of negative 1, which is just negative 1. Now, we are using a, a constant property there, but trust me, the, the limit of a constant is just that constant. Okay. Now, let's look at the other path. So path 2, we're going to take the limit z approaches 0 along y equal to 0 now. And so we'll get x minus 0 over x plus 0, which turns into the limit as z approaches 0 along y equal to 0 of just now the number 1, which of course is equal to 1. And so notice 1 is not equal to minus 1, right? So this limit will not exist by our path argument. Okay, So definitely, hopefully you guys see, this is, has a very, very similar feeling that uh, multivariable calculus did, or computing limits um, of multivariable functions. Very, very similar. Okay, so we still have the similar properties that we had back in, in calculus. So first property here, and actually this does work with a minus sign as well. I do want to point that out. But the limit distributes over a sum. So if you take the limit of the sum of two functions, you can always distribute the limit as long as those limits exist. Okay, so here, let me just put a little side note here. We are assuming that these limits exist here in all these properties. So in any case, we can distribute a limit over a sum or difference. Okay, differences work too. And notice how they have the C here. They're sort of doing a two for year. We can always pull constants out of limits. Okay, so this rule is saying we can distribute limits over sums or differences 
and we can pull out limits. I'm sorry, pull out constants. Pull out constants. Okay. Part B here. The product, the limit of the product is equal to the product of the limits. Okay, so again, let me say that again. The limit of the products is equal to the product of the limits. And then part C here, the limit of the quotient is equal to the quotient of the limit. I'm sorry, the limit of the quotient is equal to the quotient of the limits. There we go. The limit of the quotient is equal to the quotient of the limits, provided we don't blow up the universe here and divide by 0. Okay. So you can only use part C as long as your limit um, of your denominator is not 0. Because again, you don't want to blow up the universe there. So we're going to end this video with a quick uh, mention of continuity and um, a similar result that we get in calculus that we do get in complex land still. So in, uh, with continuity, we define it very, very similar to what we or how we would in, in calculus, except for one little caveat here. So let f be a complex function and let z be in the domain. Okay, so firstly, z naught, just like it, just like in calculus, if you're going to talk about continuity at a point, that point has to be in the domain. So z naught is in the domain of g, is in domain. Okay. So if z naught is in g and either z naught is an isolated point, so if you're an isolated point, then your automat your function's automatically continuous at that point by it's basically a vacuous argument, or and this is what's very similar to calculus, or the limit as z approaches z naught of f of z is equal to f of z naught. So if you're isolated, or this limit exists and is equal to f of z naught, then we say that the function is continuous at z naught. More generally, if f is continuous on some set, then we would say that f is continuous on every point in that set. So to be continuous on a set, you have to be continuous at each individual point. Now, like in calculus, we have the same requirements for continuity. So first of all, again, z naught still has to be in your domain. And two, and this is where it gets a little bit different, Either z naught is isolated, and if z naught's isolated, you're lucky because it's automatically continuous there. Or, okay, the limit not only exists, so this limit here has to exist, and it's equal to the function value. Okay, so this is kind of a twofer. So one, the limit exists. And 2 is equal to the function value. OK, so if you have a point z naught that satisfies both these, then we would say that your function is continuous at that point. And lastly, um, we, st we get a very, very similar um, uh, result that we, did that we had in calculus that deals with compositions. So let g and f be two complex functions. g has a domain of big G, F has a domain of H, okay? Then we can define the composition as, as, as usual. F composed with G is equal to, well, F. So you take Z, you plug it into G first, and then you take that and you plug it into F, okay? So we get the following result, okay? So again, let G be a complex function whose image is contained in H so that we can plug G of Z in F. And let f be another complex function. Now suppose that z naught is an accumulation point of g, okay, with the limit as z approaches z naught of g of z equal to w naught. Okay, so we're saying that the limit of g is w naught. Okay, as we approach z naught, and as long as f is continuous at w naught, then we get a really really cool result. So then, so as long as we have these things satisfied or we have these conditions met, then the limit of the composition is equal to um, f composed with the limit of the inside function. So basically what we're doing is we're distributing the limit inside the composition. So we're pushing the limit inside the composition. So as long as f is continuous and the limit of your inside function exists and is equal, and is equal to w0, then you can push a limit inside a composition like this. 
super, super helpful for calculations. All right, so next time we're gonna get into the precise epsilon delta definition of a limit. Uh, so I will see you all then.